percent were taken off the planet. Y'all need some soap up in here. <laughs> and then they brought something known as Al Cool, A L K U H L, and said after you wash your funky self, disinfect yourself. Today we call it alcohol. These Europeans, barbaric in nature, sat at the feet of these Africans and learned. They then left Europe, went to England, started a university today we call Oxford, started Cambridge. Some of them got hit, came over to America, started Columbia University. Universities that we have to fight to get into, they sat at our feet to learn to even open up the thing in the first place. We're paying all this money to be miseducated. I saw last February 11th, they had, an, uh, on prime time, they had a, a segment on the math and science scores of U.S. students. And when they went into these classrooms, they weren't looking at our children. I didn't see our children. I saw their children. And what the finding was, was that of all of the countries that took math and science exams, there were only seven countries in the world that the United States outscored. Only seven. You know, think about what I'm saying. These folk are not right. They got guns, but they're not right. They're like children with weapons. I'm afraid of a, a kindergarten child with a gun, but that don't mean they have the kind of intelligence that I have. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, I've studied their work. I am one of the reviewers of most of the curriculums that are out today from major book companies. And I'm telling you, these are some of the most ignorant, yes. most backward people I have ever experienced. I'm, I've heard Dr. Ben say that he's not scratching the surface compared to what is to be known. And I stand before you telling you I'm nowhere near scratching the surface where Dr. Ben is. So you see how far I've got to go. But there's a path. There is a way we can make this happen. There is a curriculum. And over the past 16 years, we've been working on this curriculum. And I'd like to share it with you this evening. From all of the latest information that we have, and I, I apologize if this is not clear, or as clear as it could be, but basically, what I've done is to show you Looking at the work of Dr. Theophile Obenga, Dr. Sheikh Andre Jok, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, our sister Dr. Sharshi McIntyre, looking at the work of Sister Raketi Wimby and Medu Nater, and even tapping into the work of Dr. Stephen Hawkins and Dr. Carl Sayer. If we were to say that from the very first moment of the beginning of the universe until this day, if we were to say that we would have a great cosmic year, in terms of curriculum, what we do is we teach, even if we were to say, let's teach our children from the moment of consciousness, human consciousness, the level of homo sapiens sapiens, look at where we would find ourselves on the cosmic calendar. Human consciousness arose on the planet the last 10 seconds of the last minute, of the last hour, of the last day, of the first year of the cosmic phenomenon. In other words, look at all of the history, all of these months, all were within the formation of superclusters, clusters, galaxies, star systems. The formation of the Earth occurred approximately what they say September 14. 
And it's not until December that I have to start a whole new chart to show you how much happened in the month of December, considering our great cosmic year. Humanity arose December 30th. And every one of these months represent approximately, give or take, a little over a billion years. So it is my belief that if we are to begin looking at ourselves and understanding what the Kemites and the Dogon and the Bambara meant when they said, know thyself, that we must begin at the beginning of where we as a people theorized the coming into being of the universe. With that in mind, we use the work of Dr. George G.M. James in his work, Stolen Legacy. In this work, Stolen Legacy, it is said that Shabaka, a pharaoh of the 25th dynasty, coming upon a worm-eaten document that he called the Memphite text. It was so badly worm-eaten, but it was such a valuable scientific document that he ordered his scientists to rewrite it. But this time, so that it would never be destroyed, he asked that it be written in stone. To this day, it is now called the Shabaka Stone. It rests uncomfortably in the British Museum. And it is a document that I anxiously look forward to returning to Africa. So what we're looking at, basically, the Shabaka Stone It's approximately 1.13 yards by 1.6 yards in size. It consists of two horizontal lines written at the top across the entire width of the stone. I'll show you a picture of it, and I have copies of it back there, so it'll be all right. And there are 62 columns which you begin reading on the left side and go across. It is in this text that the comedic philosophy of how the universe came into being, what would have started that first moment, in science we call it the primordial scission, that first moment where one becomes two, and then the ordering and arranging of the universe. This is what the Kemites were talking about. This is as high science as you're going to get. But what makes this so attractive is that it's the primary source. It is the oldest text we have dealing with the science of ancient Kemet. It doesn't mean it's the only one. It just means that it's the only one that we have so far. The Shabaka stone looks like this. I'll give you a closer look of it so that it's easier to understand. This is what the Shabaka stone, basically 1.13 by 1.6. Let's take a closer look at the Shabaka stone. Let's go up to the left-hand side. As you can see, you have the two horizontal lines. It's on these lines that it talks about having come up to Kemet, come to Memphis, or what the Kemites call Hikupata, and finding this document and ordering it to be redone. And then you begin the process of going down that tells the story of how the universe came into being. Now what we have done is in honor of our brother Kwame Touré, we are calling our program Truth Through Courage. What you will notice is Ma'at, and a jet column. Jet column meaning courage, ma'at meaning truth. The impression is that truth rises through courage. Courage doesn't come from truth. 
Truth comes from having courage to tell the truth. We call it, in a very interesting way, history through heritages. But if we play with the words, it becomes his story through her ages. And we have the Panthers in honor of our brother. The panther, by nature, is considered the aristocrat of the animal world. It's diplomatic by nature, but deadly when provoked. Cosmic beginnings, comedic origin. We spoke about our program. Let's look at this for a while. We have broken our curriculum into four parts. Because of the nature of the program and the awesome task, I think you can see why it took 16 years. It would have taken eight years, however, I have three children. One child doubles time, so you know what I'm talking about. You know, if we were to raise an entire nation, but fail our family, we fail 51% of our life. We can't afford to lose our families. We must keep them together. So whatever it took to keep the family together, however long, I have to double my time for study because you see, when I'm ready to type something up and my daughter jumps in my lap, we gotta put away our work. And we gotta deal with our family. Yes. Yes. Then at 12 midnight when they go to sleep, then we bring the typewriter back out. But that's the sacrifice that has to be made. We did it on the plantation. We need to do it today. It is a 10 year plan that took 16 years to create. The first part is called Ancient Beginnings. That's a five year program. Just that alone is five years. Part two is called Ancient Civilizations, which is two years. Part three is Ancient Geography, which is six months. And then Ancient America, it's two years. Let's look at part one because that's what we're ready to talk about. Part one, each part is broken up into sections and each section is broken up into terms. Part one, section A, is what we just talked about. A comedic origin of the cosmic universe. And our focus in this section is universal, cosmic, supercluster, cluster, and galactic systems. Looking at it from a primary source, the Shabaka Stone, at the Pyramid Text, the Coffin Text, the Book of the Coming Forth Today by Night, the Bremerin Papyrus. These are all primary sources. Copernicus, Galileo, all of them studied these sources. They admit it themselves. They admit that they studied the golden law of planetary motion by the ancient chemists. They admit this. It's just not written in the textbook. Section B is comedic and dogon origins of the solar system. Our focus will be star systems. What is the energy of the sun? You see, the material and the spiritual world are flip sides of the same. You can substantiate, you can prove what you can't see by understanding what you do see. And that's what the Chemites would do. They would hook into what they know, which to them they call Amenet, to reveal what they couldn't see, which was Amen, the hidden. And what they were able to do was to develop a life system that would enable them to tap into so-called secrets. There are no secrets in the universe. They're open for Ma'ati and I to see. Nothing is secret. You don't need a PhD. You don't need a master's degree. You don't even need to go to school. You don't need to be literate in order to achieve cosmic greatness. And the only evidence I can give you is you. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for our ancestors who never went to school. 
And when you stop and think about them, the first person that gave somebody a PhD had to have been someone without one. Because you sit in a classroom don't make you wise. It just means you sat in that classroom. There could be people outside learning more than you. Not only can it be, but for the most part it is. Section C of part one is Rob visiting the Shabaka stone and the Memphite text by focusing on earth systems and the life system of the earth. What happened starting September 14th that would have brought forward all the things that would then bring forward section D, which is plant and human photosynthesis, the role of chlorophyll and melanin in organizing organic life on earth. I have some tapes on melanin. I did a four part series, and then I have other materials. And you know, you heard Attorney Maddox talking about them not being able to reproduce. Brothers are absolutely correct. And I'm not saying this because I'm upset. I'm not saying this because I'm trying to mess with nobody. I'm not emotional or passionate about this. This is a scientific reality. Bring me your books, I bring you my books, and we can talk about it. The, the reason why it's like that is because melanin is found in every organ and gland in your system, particularly your reproductive system. And when you have a lack of melanin, it has an impact on both the male and the female, some way or another. In terms of the male, the spermatozoa has a tail that moves and swims towards the egg. Well, in a lack of melanin, there's no movement in that tail. That tail is slow. Can't go too far. It dies before it can even get halfway near the egg. In a lack of melanin. A brother, well melanated, well, that, from the moment that spermatozoa gets within the womb temple of the woman, that's speeding up towards the egg. It's got a lot of life in it. That's what melanin does to that tail. It gives it electricity. In the female, she has magnetism. Her egg draws the sperm. In a woman that is not well melanated, the egg lacks strong magnetism. So you put a European man together with a European woman, you got a slow-moving spermatozoa and an unmagnetic egg. But amongst people of color, well-melanated, you got a swimming spermatozoa and a magnetic egg. So guess what? Their only way to survive is to find a black woman or a black man because within the European woman, the lack of the magnetism of the, of the egg is made up for in the movement of the male spermatozoa. And the lack of movement in the European spermatozoa is made up for in the magnetism of the African woman's egg. So when Brother Maddox is talking about the inability to reproduce, see, they gotta take eggs, give them 20 children at a time. I say, you're not giving birth to children, you got a dog litter there. And but you see the sister and the brother that had the five children, they didn't use any fertility pills. They did it au natural. Are you wondering why they fear you? See, this is what I liked about Kwame Torre. I remember when he'd be interviewed and, he, and people would talk to him about the terrible conditions in our community, he would turn it around and say, well, the reason why it's like that is because they know that if you step into who you are, you'll eradicate them in no time. He always turned things around to help us understand the flip side of this because I teach the children, they don't hate us. They fear us. And out of the fear comes the illogical feeling of hate. There's no doubt in my mind why they feel towards us the way they do. My problem is we don't see it. For 16 years I've sat on this curriculum, never going out, 
except for here in the family. Never asked, well, in fact, I'm not even going to the Board of Ed with this. Because, you know, the Board of Ed is not fair. They're succeeding. They're doing their job real good. Their purpose and function is to miseducate our children. If you can start from there, then we can change this whole thing around. You think because they're pumping money in and adding more books and doing this and fixing up the buildings, that's to give them jobs. I know, I'm in the system. It takes a lot to be in the system and talk about it. Sometimes they have problems. I told a group the other day, and many of them were not necessarily us. They were getting a little flip in the audience, and I said, I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to shut some of these people up here. So I said, you know, Dr. Khalid Muhammad, <laughs> you want a quiet room? Just use that word. That'll shut them all. I said, you know, Dr. Khalid Muhammad, I said, you know, I hear a lot of people got problems with him. But I was with some brothers the other day. If you think Khalid Muhammad is something, wait till you see his grandchildren. Because the reason why Khalid Muhammad is the way he is is because you didn't listen to Malcolm. And his grandchildren are going to do to you what you're not listening to him for. I've never heard him say anything untrue. He may say things in a way that people don't like, but I've never heard him speak anything that was untrue. And of course I ended all of this by saying I anxiously await to see his grandchildren. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do, each time I'm doing this, I'm focusing closer and closer in to what we'd like to develop this evening. Part one, section A, is broken up into three terms. Every term being approximately what a college course would be, 13 to 15 weeks. Term one deals with the introduction, a holistic educational plan. Term two deals with the signature of Atum, the dawn of consciousness, and term three deals with professional development. How do you teach a comedic origin of the cosmic universe? Now, let us take term one, because that is ready to go into place. Right now. Thirteen classes. The introduction with a resource guide, talking of a vision and a mission. You cannot start anything, particularly a curriculum guide, without a vision. A vision is what do you see. A mission is how do you plan to fulfill what you see. The method. We deal with definitions and applications because we're introducing comedic words that many of our community members may never have been exposed to. We look at the holistic educational plan and we break it up into the disciplines and the topics that we want our children to excel in because this is not just astronomy. This is not just physics. This is language arts, performing arts, mathematics, and every other kind of science between chemistry and oceanography. The African philosophy, as Theophile Obenga presents it to us, this doctor says, along with Dr. Sheikh Ante Diop, that in fact not only did Africans philosophize, but they in fact invented the word itself. Philosophia, the love of wisdom. Sophia being wisdom. We look at the five periods of African philosophy with the fifth period being what we are experiencing now. The four educational centers, we go deep in depth and we look at it. Four in particular that Dr. Obenga and Dr. Diop talk about. Memphis, or Hikupata, Thebes, Heliopolis, and Hermopolis. What did they teach in these centers? While each of them dealt with a particular area, all four centers were related. Most interestingly, 
way to develop an educational system. You know, we got colleges teaching all the same thing. Can you imagine taking City College and breaking them up all into different philosophies, but you've got to know all four philosophies to put the whole picture together? That'd make people come together and be cooperative. And cooperate. You don't have to ask people to cooperate, you've got to cooperate. This is the way they set up their educational system. Cooperation was embedded in the very nature of how they learned and taught. We do reviews. We look at texts. What are the ancient African texts? Because to me that's very important. What is the writing? What is the written form? What is the pyramid text? Where is it? What is the coffin text? What does it mean? Shabaka stone. What is being said? Now, the Moratunga. Very interesting. I want to jump just a bit. But I want to show you something. This is not the greatest um, copy, but I have to do something in order to at least bring some of it to you. This is a December sky, what we're experiencing right now. And I'd like you to pay attention to the southeast here. It's a very important, a very important relationship in these stars. You'll notice here. Triangular, that's a constellation. At the, head of constel at, at the head of this constellation, Triangular, you have a star known as Beta. This is Triangulum here, it's formed in, of, of a triangle. There are four constellations that we have to be aware of in this picture. Canis Major, Orion, Taurus, Triangular. The Nomuratunga stars are stars that were found to be in northern Kenya, southern Ethiopia, that actually were in place and utilized by Konso people, by African people, at least 300 years before the Christian era. If that is true, then they would have to have started their research thousands of years before that date in order to understand the flavor of the movement of the constellation. But what's so important to see is that out of here you come down and you come upon certain stars that they tracked. In Taurus it was the Pleiades. In Orion you had a number of different... Saif was one, S-A-I-P-H, by the way, which is a Moorish word. You then come down into, through Taurus, down through Orion, into Sirius, which is this star right here. Now, if I were to draw a line connecting these stars, you would have a serpent in the sky, which then goes forward to understand why serpents were so important. But more importantly, I would want to do research. If I were, if I had the time and ability, I would want children to do research on what is this triangulum right here. What system is it pointing to? And that's where you're going to find your cosmic energy. There's enough evidence, whether it be the pyramids, whether it be Dogon text, whether it be other texts from Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, throughout the African continent, north, south, central, east, and west, showing that they understood cosmic power. See, there are four kinds of civilizations, so-called. You could make many, you could make less. But every civilization is based on from whence they draw their energy. This civilization is based on Earth. Oil, gas, water, wind. The pyramids, from my research, it's obvious they were aware at least of solar power. They knew how to tap into the energy of the sun. There's no question in my mind that the Chemites were well advanced of this civilization as we see it today. So advanced it can't be explained. But so advanced and can't be explained that these numbskulls will say that aliens came down. You know, you've got to really be deep into a little red riding hood syndrome to create a fairy tale like that. But you see, they know that if you have to deal with earthbound people, 
doing this, you have to deal with the fact that this was done before Europeans had even depigmented themselves to be alive. You have to admit that right off. Because the European that we know today is no older than between 10 and 6,000 years old. No older than that. You go back beyond that, you got yourself an African Eurasian called Cro-Magnon. You go beyond that, you got Grimaldi, all African. Didn't exist. They are mutations. When we couldn't get it right, we became them. And the reason why they're trying to live so long, because I saw that news article that uh, Brother Maddox was talking but I saw that too. And you're right. They got to prolong their life because they know that after this, the game is up. You go back 10,000 years, 15,000 years, they were not on this planet. They were not here. Now, I'm not angry. I'm not saying this because I'm emotional. I'm not wishing them any ill, although... No. This is scientific fact. You either here or you're not. I'm not getting emotional with you. It's either historical fact. You're here or you're not here. This is what you call a true-false question. It's not about opinion. You either here or you're not. And just like they were not here yesterday, they will not be here tomorrow. And again, I'm not saying this to anger. Robert De Niro knows if he wants his life on this earth in the next millennia, he guts to find himself an African woman. He, he says that, you know, when you bring two opposites together, the mixture makes it nice. That ain't what it is. It's your survival, my friend. That's why you see so many newscasts now with the African woman with the European male, because psychologically these are our parents. They're giving us the news. That's why you've got so many Miss Americas and Miss World and Miss Universe looking like us. Because they're trying to entice the, Afri uh, the European male to understand, man, the only way you're going to survive is if you mate with that black woman. That's the only way you're going to survive. And you see, like Brother Maddox said, he not going to die. All that happens in this plane is the constitution and the reconstitution of atoms. So you give up this vessel, you do it again. And if you do it right the first time, you don't have to go through the nonsense the second time. I've often said that J. Edgar Hoover was reborn in a Soweto community. Let him deal with that. Because he created the condition, let him live it. I would like to move now, moving out of part one, I'd like to look at part two. Part two is ancient civilization. When you move out of cosmic beginnings, we then go into ancient civilizations. We look in section A, and I've not divided this up into the terms yet, because that's yet to come. This is five, five years down the road. Section A is dealing with the life history of the human family. The focus is the development of consciousness from savage to barbaric, from barbaric to civilized. We were civilized in my research for millions of years before we depigmented ourselves. There is a theory that says that we depigmented ourselves and did a number of things at a particular time in our history and so we perfected ourselves when we depigmented ourselves. Well, that's not true. In fact, we regressed when we depigmented ourselves. In section B, we deal with Ethiopia and her Kushite civilization, looking at the sacred science of the Happy Valley. We then move into the rise of Pharaonic African civilization from pre-dynastic Kemet through the Pyramid Age, focusing on pyramid technology and the Kemetic society. Section D is the Nubian origins of the 18th dynasty, looking at the twin temples of Luxor and Nubian philosophy. We have a very heavy biology class in here. 
where we looked at the Grand Lodge, or what is known as the, is the Ibet et Waset, where they actually built this temple in the direct proportions of the human body. Absolutely brilliant. And that as they built the temple, they also divided it up into different parts of the body. And the way in which we know it is that on the walls, where all of these parts of the body are located, is the explanation and the function of that part of the body. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. You're not going to find no beer cans in the middle of these buildings. You're not going to find no cigarette butts in the middle of these buildings. And you see, the priests don't come after the building is built. That don't make no sense to me. I want the priest to come and the priestess to come before you touch the soil. Because if it's built wrong, everybody going down together. So it doesn't do any good to bring the priest to bless the building after it's built. You gotta bring that spiritual leader before it's built. And while it's built, and then after it's built. And that's the way Chemites build buildings. Section E deals with the Nubian origins of the 25th dynasty. The focus is Nubian, Marotic, Kushite thought in Africa and ancient America, looking at the works of Dr. Ivan Van Sertima and focusing on the African presence in America. Why would Africans be here? And then we have a, a participation project that brings together all of the information we've had on the pyramid dynasties to bring it all together. Some heavy stuff here, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Our ancestors were absolutely brilliant. I just am constantly awed at what I learned about them. And you know the most wonderful thing about them? About our ancestors? Is that the mark of a true genius was how simple they could make complex issues. See, when you get into these universities and they start speaking Latin and Greek, they really change the language to let you know, or try not to let you know how much they really don't know. So they change the language up on you and you think it's something big and all they're doing is stammering and stuttering over something they don't understand. They still don't understand. In ancient geography, we look at three sections. And the reason why we look at these is because of where we're going to go after this. We look at grid lines and compass roads. How did ancient Africans travel around the world? Let's get this out in the open right now so we can understand this. Because if you were to look, and as Dr. Van Sertema talked about, if you look at the way which they express it, it's like nothing happened in the world before they came along. What's so funny is that they learned everything that was going on from African people. But they'll make you think that they invented it all. Compass rolls. In the middle of the pyramid, Khufu's pyramid, there is a grand gallery. This grand gallery is exactly the longitude and latitude line, 30 east, 30 north. If they understood that the grand gallery was built on a grid line that divided the world into 360 degrees, they had to have traveled around the world in order to make that happen. You can't do that. I can't. I can't draw a map of this room if I have not been in the room. I can't tell you what's in the back of the room unless I've been back there. How are you going to divide the world up and make something so precise as the Grand Gallery, which is like a, I don't want to call it a tunnel, but it's a long passageway through the middle of the pyramid that is actually on a grid line, not just north, but east. How brilliant they must have been back then to build this. So right there you know how they could have found their way to America. You know how they could have found their way to Asia because they had divided the world into 360 degrees. They knew. First of all, you know they knew the world was round. So that tells you something about what happened centuries later. In section B, we look at wind systems and ocean currents. The wind systems that would help the boats, help whatever means of transportation on the waters they had 
to get to the different parts of the world, but the ocean currents, three ocean currents leave the coast of Africa, and all three will lead you right into the Gulf of Mexico. You could be on a non-powered boat, on a raft, and if you put it in the waters, off the coast, that, what Dr. Van Sermer calls moving roads, the currents, would bring you into America without you even putting your hand out there to push you like that. So between the wind systems and ocean currents, Africans could have made it to America with no power. Well, we know they had powered boats. We know that because we found them in the pyramids. Khufu's pyramid. Seneferu, who was the father of Khufu, had a boat that when they took the boat out, the smell, cedar of Lebanon, was as fresh as it was when they compacted in the room in the first place. That's how they knew how to put things together. Boats that could carry quite a few people. What these little rowboats? It was big boats. So why people wonder why they could get you don't big, big you don't build big boats like that just to stay on the happy or the Nile River. You you might create a feluca, but you're not gonna create a big boat. Big boats for big water. Yes. <laughs> this is common sense, brothers and sisters. We're walking through this. What natural phenomenon assisted these ancient mariners? Section C deals with boat building and trade in the ancient world, which goes back into Seneferu's boats and into the boats, into pictures of boats. Go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They'll show you the boats. They'll show you a whole group of Africans standing on these boats. Where are these boats going? Why are they there? They will lead you to believe that they were just sightseeing. This is what they tell us in the museum. It's such nonsense. How did ancient Africans travel? And for what purpose? did they set sail? And finally, we've looked at the beginnings, the cosmic beginnings. We've looked at ancient civilizations that would have brought Africans from moments of savagery to barbarianism to civilized life. We've then moved through their consciousness to the point of building boats and building civilizations and traveling around the world. Now let's look at the original African American history. Ancient America. Section A. Ancient Americans. Who were they? Where did they come from? Looking at the work of our brother, Dr. Renoko Rashidi, he records four migrations of human beings onto the American continent. The first one was the Twa people. The very short snatched African people were the first people to set foot on the American continent. After the Twa people, there came what was known as the Clovis Folsom. Clovis Folsom being where they were found in New Mexico. Found by a brother too, McJunker. And he came to realize that these were taller statured African peoples. So the second migration was another group of African peoples. This is before the Ice Age and all this happens. The third migration, he says, is the Algonquin, who came in larger numbers, but not enough to swallow the gene pool. And then the fourth and final migration was who they call the Eskimo. And they came over in large numbers after the Ice Age, and they joined this three-part gene pool, so that when the Euro European came, he saw what he called the red man. You don't get to be red without mixing brown and yellow. And they have to have been a dark complexion people because they were called red, but the red called them pale. So I don't know where they're getting all these people for these Native American movies, because they didn't look like that. In fact, I've been on reservations where they have told me, and I'm talking about in America, that the original Native American was my complexion. This is history, but they will, they, they will 
Hollywooded so that we will forget who we are and the connection we have with our Native American brothers and sisters as Dr. Sharsha McIntyre constantly is reminding us, don't lose that. Because that spirituality deeply embedded in the Native American is so close to the African philosophy, you can see the connection with the two peoples. The Olmec civilization, section B, who were they and where did they come from? Who were the Olmecs? Why are there these massive stone heads that weigh up to 13 tons with these wide noses and thick lips and the Nubian helmets on? that they will say is because they had blunt instruments and they couldn't make those small features with these blunt instruments. Okay, now I can go along with that, but now you have to explain to me why they have the Semitic head right next to it built at the same time. I mean, they, they found some small, they found the tools for that face. Kujichaguli, self-determination. Power is the ability to define your reality and have someone accept that definition. They've been handing us a bunch of nonsense. And the only power they have is the power we give them by believing that nonsense. Section C of part four. The Temple Tomb Pyramid at Palenque. We make very serious com comparisons between the burial practices and the life systems of the ancient Americans with the ancient Ethiopians or the Nubians at this particular time in history. And we see there's a phenomenal relationship between the two peoples, that there is a lively trade going on between these two continents, and that just as there are Africans coming to America, there are Native Americans going to Africa. We look at the Pyramid of the Sun and the Moon at Teotihuacan, right outside of Mexico City. These pyramids of the Sun and the Moon are built in the same cardinal points as the ones in Africa. There is a street in the middle called Avenida de las Huertas, which means the Avenue of the Dead, the same avenue that's in Africa. And then finally, we wrap it all up with a participation project where we compare the African pyramids with the American pyramids. And we find that there is a most interesting relationship between the two. My brothers and sisters, this is a very real curriculum. And this is very real information. What I'd like to do is, I just want to interrupt at this moment and find out how much time I have. Because I really don't want to go over my time, but I want to make sure that we're able to look at a couple of things. Just to just throw out some of the time that I have, so I can just gear myself towards the rest of my presentation. Oh, uh, say 15. 15 minutes? Good. That's just what I need. Brothers and sisters, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you the beginnings of the Memphite text, because I want to do something with you, because I want to show you something that we do with our children. It's called multiple intelligences. You know, there's a gentleman by the name of Howard Gardner. You know, I respect them, but let me tell you something, it's nothing new. See, they take our stuff, put their name on it, all of a sudden it's new. But I respect his work though. I respect his work, I respect what he did. And what he did was, he was a psychiatrist out of Harvard University who did counseling. And he came to realize that many of his patients that came to him had many different ways of expressing themselves. And that what would be considered to be an intelligence in the Western sense is not the only kind of intelligence that you can have. And what he said is that you can be talented, you can be a genius in music, you can be talented intrapersonally, which ministers are intrapersonal, people who meditate are intrapersonally gifted. It's self-reflection. You, you can be gifted there. Spatial or visual, your artists, your engineers that build buildings, your architects, your sculptures. Kinesthetic, movement. You can be a genius in movement. Michael Jordan is a genius in movement. They say that that brother defies the law of gravity. He doesn't defy the law of gravity. Brother becomes one with gravity. 
And who's to tell the law what the law can do? When you law, you lay it down. So when Michael Jordan goes up for 10 seconds, they say, well, how'd that brother do it? I've seen that brother say, he don't know how he do it. I think that's unfortunate. Because if he knew how he did it, he could go up and not come down. <laughs> or he could go up and choose when he wants to come down. He did it for 10 seconds. If you do it for 10 seconds, you could do it for 10 years. So kinesthetic is a way you can be talented. Interpersonal, you can be gifted and talented. Politicians are gifted. President Clinton is gifted interpersonal. It doesn't mean right or wrong, good or bad. It just means that you can lie and people believe it. Because you know something? We all knew he was a dog when he came out the pound. <laughs> I'm surprised that we're surprised. Just because he plays sax on I'll send you don't make him hip. I'm going to leave him alone. Because something coming on him, I'm telling you. In fact, it's all over them, period. And I'm telling you, stay out of their way. You know, it goes back to what Malcolm used to say. Boss, we not sick. You sick. <laughs> and that's very important for us to understand. You see, because when that White House goes on fire, like Malcolm, I'm hoping a wind carries it through the whole yes. building. Yes. In fact, I'm looking for some ID4 up in there. Yes. But you know, struggle makes you your true spirit come out. It really makes you show what you're made of. That's why I respect Attorney Maddox so much. Because when it was time to do it, you did it. I also keep my eye on people who took advantage of that. And they're very popular today. I'm gonna leave that alone. Everybody must be accountable to the community. I don't care who you are. That's true. Everybody must be accountable. And we must be brave enough to hold them accountable. I don't care who they are. See, when we straightened up to get the European off our back, I mean, we didn't do that so that a black man could jump in. We don't want nobody on our back. In the very beginning of time, before all and everything existed, everything existed unordered and misarranged in the waters of Nun. Now I'd like to just go through an activity because I'm going to guarantee you something before this is over. And I want to show you how you can learn using different kind of methods. Rising up out of Nun, through the power of Atum, I'm sorry, through the power of Ma'at, or the balance, came Patah. Patah. Patah many times is seen in a mummified form holding a staff with an ankh on top like this. Okay, keep this picture in mind. Like this. Patah is seen at the potter's wheel, but he's also seen standing like this. Rising through the waters of Nun, through the power and the energy of Patah, Rose Atum. Atum is creative intelligence, or our young people say word up. And they don't know how close to the truth they are. See, our ancestors are talking to them, because the word does travel up. It is true. Now, what's important is that. Atum
This is another version of it. It's the waters of Nun. You can see the wavy lines. You see my hand? Keep this, in, this vision in mind. Nun, the wavy waters. Rising up through Nun starts the beginning of Pata, or the organizing and the reorganizing of the cosmic universe. Pata represents energy. Now, there's something to remember about matter. Matter has two characteristics as we say it today in science. It takes up space and it has weight. Matter. Energy, there are two types of energy. There is potential energy or energy at rest. And then there's, exactly, kinetic energy or energy in motion. Pata, from the kinetic perspective, represents not just energy, but the conversion of energy. Pata is an action. Rising up out of Nun through the power of Pata comes Atun. Now, I'm sorry. We pick up Atum rises from Pata, sits atop Pata, and Atum is the unique creative intelligence. Atum was given the ability to continue the process of becoming. Atum names the essences of pre existing order and arrangement. In science today, we call this the Ogdod, or the gods of chaos. I tend to stay away from both the word God and chaos because gods to the ancient Chemites is not what the word gods means in the English language. Chemites call it nether, natures. I stay away from chaos because God doesn't create chaos. God creates order and the movement yes. from God is chaos. See, God didn't create evil. God created good and gave you free choice to be evil. We created evil. Atum calls four pairs into being. He calls Nun. Now remember, Nun is the first, but Nun has no name. So Nun has to create a process of becoming so that what he, she creates will name him herself. So Atum names Nun and calls it Nun, calls it into being. Nun represents wetness and moisture, rivers, seas, oceans, waves, deluges, floods, springs, hydrogen, water, all the principles of what liquid might be. Nunet represents the heavens, air, oxygen, carbon dioxide, sky, space, atmosphere, carbon dioxide. The second pair, Ha. Ha represents, and is male, countless, limitless, without boundaries, forever eternal. It represents infinity. Ha head represents the limited, the bounded, the counted, the measured, and the number. Please know also, I could have presented this to you with the feminine first. We're not dealing here with what came first. We're dealing with what is, because in the story, they all came at the same time, but they came in a particular order. Her head is the limited, the bounded, the counted, the measured, and the number. The third pair, cock and coquette. Cock represents the unknown, the ignorant, the shadow, the night. Coquette represents the known, the intelligent, and the dead, darkness and light. The fourth pair, Amen, Amenet. Amen represents the concealed, the unheard, the untouched, without smell or taste, the unseen and the invisible. Amenet represents the revealed, the tangible, the seen, the touchable. It has smell and she has taste. This was the naming ceremony. Pata plus Atum plus the four pairs equal ten, which is the basis of the number ten system. 
and the four pairs remain in the waters of Nun as frogs and snakes. Frogs representing metamorphosis, snakes representing resurrection. Because that truly is what resurrection is. It's resurrection. Scientifically, what we're talking about is that atoms are ordered and arranged, molecules are formed, magnetic fields, balance, electrical currents, and Kepler, the process of becoming continues. This is what our ancestors put in place. This is the same thing we teach in science today. Whether you are in elementary school, or postgraduate studies. This is the basis of astrophysics. And through our program and our class, we will continue. We will stress this. But there's something I want to do. Because I want to show you how everyone's going to be here. And you're going to know all these things. You will know with no problem. You believe me? Did I tell that?